is the radio, about antioxidants. They're used to what? Eliminate bad things so the body and the cells do not deteriorate. So food items like fruits, vegetables, great antioxidants because they stop bad things like free radicals from developing in the body. The second one, nerve conductive facilitator. Sounds like a long name. Your nerves are what make your body work. Conduction facilitate. Something makes your body and the cells and the fibers and the electricity flow quicker. Melanin does that. There's studies showing that it can be a uh, thermal active like transistor where it can make energy change. And you know that because you drop your hands, get warm. You hear about the scenario saying that when black people get together, they draw heat? <laughs> That's an external melanin, but look at it on a physical level when you have plastics and things like graphene. New technology is coming about that using blackness to kind of facilitate the way energy can be transmitted. So on a physical level, if you can do that with technology and things like space shows, like airplanes, what's happening in the body? Can you move your body and your brain to another level of consciousness? And it happens via these mechanisms. The third one, energy transformer. Everywhere you see melanin in the body, it functions to transfer energy from one form to another so your body can recognize it. What do you mean by that? Let's make it simple. Light. Light waves are out here. Your body has an eyeball. On the back of the eyeball is your retina. In the retina is a pigmented cell layer. In that pigmented cell layer, there are some cells that what give you a sense of what you're seeing. If those cells don't exist, guess what? You're basically blind. There's a disease called retinitis pigmentosis, where the people who lack the pigment layer on the back of the eye, they can't see right. So the melanin are helping to convert those light waves to what you can see. Inner ear melanin, sound waves become very important. Sound waves, that means music, that means information that's out there as a wave, but your body must now interpret it as sound, frequencies. There's different levels of music that comes from African people, or black people, you go all over the world, Islands, Pacific Islands, Middle America, wherever there's black people, there's always what? Rhythm, beat, maybe bass. That's not a, a European experience. They may listen to high pitched music, uh, high frequency, not the low bass and the thumping amplitude. So, is there something going on with the body that deals with that? Yeah, melanin. Beyond vibrations in the ear, you also got vibrations that touch your skin. How do you know that? Because you got some bad vibes you hang around some people. Where's that coming from? <laughs> people give off vibrations. So melanin as an entity that's in our body as a physical element, it has energy transforming abilities and the same thing is going on in the universe. When you start talking about dark matter, dark secrets, out in the universe, 98% of the universe is dark matter that they don't know what it is. Right. Don't know what it is, but you don't know what it is. It's, it's, nerve, it's melanin. It's darkness, carbon-based, which is the part of all life. So as a pigment, you can't exist without pigments. Prior to this ex I guess, discussion and presentation, the brother was asking about uh, an albino correct kangaroo that just came out in the news that, hey, they found a kangaroo out in Australia that you know, now has suffering some problems. Guess what, there's a lot of albino animals that suffer from problems. Mm -hmm. On a dynamics of human beings being albinos, the challenge they have is they can't exist in the sun because they're lacking the melanin that what stops the cells from deteriorating. Mm -hmm. Beyond the skin, people who have albinism also have internal problems. That's why you have to wear the dark glasses. Because the sun will tear up the eyes. They also have hearing challenges. So everywhere the melanin is in the brain can also be impacted by a person who has albinism. So again, just to start off, we haven't gotten to the brain yet, have we? We haven't gotten to my, the eye of Haru yet. This is all the baseline. Brother Antonio says, man, they want to hear this. I say, all right, well, it's hard science. They want to know it. You tell me this. So you're all going to get it. All right. So when you look at the issue of melanin as a <coughs> compound, if you see on your left side there, that is uh, something called theomelanin, P-H-E-O melanin. That's the one that's pretty much for people who have like freckles and like red. Red, red hair, 
it's failed no so that structure there is just showing how carbon nitrogen and oxygen <coughs> their formation gives you this solid structure the other one called ewell melanin the eu melanin is where brown and black pigment comes from so latex latex l-a-t-t-i-c-e latex so the way the structure is configured it's like almost indestructible can't break it down and that's kind of like how melanin is outside the body and inside the body. There's a very important place dead in the center of the brain that contains melanin and there's a problem in the brain and behavior when it's not working right. It's called a substantia nigra. We'll see you later when we see some brain images, but substantia nigra is a black area in the middle of the brain, your brain, that when your cells deteriorate, they no longer work as well anymore, you don't produce the right chemicals anymore, behaviors impact. One particular behavior is called Parkinson's disease. So people have a movement problem in Parkinson's disease where they have shakes and tremors. It's because that area of the brain is no longer what producing the melanin, producing the dopamine, which is the chemical, causing the behavioral problems. If you look at it on the end, as I try to express in the books, if someone can have a problem because the brain area is not working right, it happens to be pumping volume up. Do you like to slam dunk basketballs with your eyes closed behind your legs? <laughs> Did you see the All-Star game 2016 <laughs> in Toronto? Yeah. Just like Superman. <laughs> Flat men. Superman. Doing monumental feats for the basketball. We can do that with a basketball. What else can we do? We don't talk about that. So here we are, I guess I forgot to thank Cleveland State University for bringing me here also, or maybe not bringing me, but provide the facility, the environment. Yeah. Why here at Cleveland State University may not be a, I don't know, receptive or uh, excited about having a lot of black people around. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so there's probably a lot of universities that are too quite excited about having a lot of black people around. <laughs> and the question becomes why? Threatened by something? Because if you think about the whole civil rights movement and the issue of integration, they didn't want to integrate, they wanted to keep us alone and separate. And we know the whole scenario with 1954 Brown versus Board of Education, it created some scenarios and challenges for us because we had schools, we had businesses, we had banks, we had, and when integration happened, we lost banks, we lost schools, we lost our institutions. The bottom line though, as I'm making the comment here about this issue of civil rights and targeting you and saying that you're inferior. Well, if you're so inferior, then why create so many laws to what? Keep you in check. Think about it. Think real deep about that. If you're inferior, you never do nothing. Because you will never rise to that level. And if you see in all the places that deal with not just sports, but the dynamic of just administration, I think there's a black president, isn't it? What, eleven more months? Yeah. So the dynamic of us excelling in any area becomes a threat to some. And that's why I'm saying this issue of melanin becomes real key and critical. Uh, kind of hard and busy, but for those who get the DVD, so we'll buy about the hand talking 360 degrees of truth. You can see in detail chemicals that produce the melanin in your brain and your body. Come from your diet. Come from your diet. I mean, if you're eating foods, they may contain amino acids. What are amino acids? The building blocks of the protein. What are proteins? Everything your body needs to thrive. Some amino acids could be something like tyrosine. So tyrosine is a, that word, the precursor, I mean, it's a chemical that comes before. So tyrosine is a precursor molecule. When you get the DVD, you'll be able to see the sequence of chemicals that lead to making melanin. You know why this is pretty deep? Because those who lack enzymes to convert that tyrosine may suffer from things such as albinism. People who are albinos lack the enzymes to convert the tyrosine to make melanin. That's number one. Number two is there's a disease called PKU, phenylketonuria. I'm not in the class, so I'm not going to be writing on the chalkboard, but I'm letting you know you can go look on your own a disease called PKU. In this scenario, Precursor molecule for tyrosine is phenylalanine. Many of you may have heard of phenylalanine because of the, you know, certain items, food items that contain it. Phenylalanine and tyrosine make neurotransmitters. Guess what? 
if those chemicals aren't there, those amino acids, you don't have neurotransmitters like dopamine, like norepinephrine, like epinephrine. That becomes problematic to your behavior. That means people with PKU have problems with their pigmentation, light and scalp color and skin, and they also have mental retardation that can occur. It's a recessively linked disorder, genetically recessively linked disorder. Or it can be corrected by manipulating the diet. Or so most genetic disorders cannot be before PKU, you manipulate the diet. What do you do? You do not, don't give them a lot of phenylalanine because it's toxic to the brain. Those who consume NutraSweet, it says it on the labels. Phenyl ketone uretics, do not take. Also on the same label for those who consume NutraSweet, it says if you're pregnant, don't take. That's pretty deep in itself. I don't think anybody should take it. When you're pregnant, you can't take it, why are you consuming it? We now know all the studies that are going on that are about aspartame, which is NutraSweet, and then the phenylalanine that's in it can have an impact on your body. Not a good thing. So now, as we phase into knowing that, again, what we put into our body is important. Melanin is a very important molecule that needs to be in our body. How do you make sense of this? Plants. Plants are life. Plants can also be food. There's a pigment in plants called what? Chlorophyll. No pigment in the plant, there's no life. It's the exact same thing with African people or people in general with melanin. No melanin, no life. I've never seen a white plant. It's a cauliflower, the green leaves are green. You can't exist without the pigmentation. So the pigment becomes important for all life. So what did the ancient African scientists like Imhotep see? Black history month, Imhotep, first creator of the pyramid. That period, uh, they call him the uh, vizier. He was the uh, chief for the uh, pharaoh. He was an architect, he was a priest, he was a medical doctor. First multi, first world multi genius. World genius. genius. In all of our genius, genius. The dynamic of Imhotep. If you actually, whoever's a uh, what do you call it, medical doctor, uh, they have to take a Hippocratic oath. But if you look at the Hippocratic Oath, it says all praises do the Escalapius. That's the Greek name for Imhotep. So Imhotep and scientists back in the day were not just studying buildings and fixtures, they were studying people and our presence and our reason to even be here. So this Heru and the term Heru comes from African terminology. You see there on your left side, it says Osar, Oset, and Heru. On your right side there, the Greeks named them Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Because now you know Greek history is like 640 to 322 BC. Greek history is 640 to 322 BC. African history is 4,000 years. 5,000 years. It's much older than that little teeny period of Greek history. But the Greeks came in. And that's how when we read our books, the beginning of Western civilization, they use that as a foundation, huh? So they rename things. So if the Europeans or invaders renamed Osar, Oset, and Heru to Osiris, Isis, and Horus, that's what you normally hear and think of. But it's all synonymous, okay? And then on the bottom right there, really it's synonymous with Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Perhaps you thought about it, maybe not. <coughs> but you have scholars that have discussed this, and our discussion here on Heru becomes important because Heru becomes this, this physical symbol, but also a manifestation of what's going on with the so called uh, relationship here. Osiris is the god of the dead, because Heru is the god of the living. Isis, being the female, was like the, the progenitor to make sure things would work out. There's a story, the Osirian myth. Perhaps some of you know about it. But Osiris, or Osar, and his brother, Set, were kind of like <coughs> opposites. They were twin brothers. Set, Set sounds like what? Satan. Osar and Set had a fight. <coughs> so there's many allegories and many versions of how the story is told. The point is that Set, as the bad side, dismantled. Osiris or Osar and spread his body parts all around. But the one part missing is the phallus. So 
Isis and Haru were doing what they could to go find the parts, but they resurrected the missing part into something called an obelisk. So the obelisk is what you see there in Washington, D.C. is one of the largest ones, but it makes a white large penis in Washington, D.C. But obelisks are all over the world, but coming from Africa, from this story. So Heru. Heru was the holder of the earth and ruled the domain of the living. Osar was the father of Heru and the savior of man. All that sounds like Christianity, doesn't it? The one who was crucified and resurrected. Osar ruled the dead. God, however, rules over both the living and the dead. The resurrection myth shows there is no such thing as oblivious, unconscious death. God can make death become life, even though it cannot be seen with the naked eye. So, in ancient Egypt, light of Africa. Light from ancient Africa. So Akbar is a psychologist is trying to get us to understand what the ancients were looking at and seeing and interpreting for what we are seeing experience today. Many of you have had experiences where someone's passed away and you've now had some, some spiritual experiences beyond that, from that, around that. Well, not only that you probably can't explain, you don't know what's going on, but it's because some people understand and appreciate reincarnation. Some people can't put their hands and grasp around it because they don't understand the nature of spirits. For African people, and I'm gonna tell you a quick story as I go on with the slides about this term called Saku, S-A-K-H-U, Saku, is what we define as an African people of what really is psychology. Psychology, psyche is a Greek word for mind. But it all comes from Africa with a term called Saku, which we now get from Brother William Nobles and Brother Diane Mokbar, which they got from a European scholar named Gerald Massey. Gerald Massey wrote Ancient Egypt Light of the World. So you got a white scholar that's going deep into Africa and, and interpreting things like this. So there's a baseline somewhere. Like I said, I don't, it's not like I created this. I now have a knowledge base to now share it with you about what's really going on in the brain. But Saku means the, uh, the illuminator, the eye and soul being, the inspirer. There's a female aspect of it, like she. So in that context, there's a whole lot going on with how people, and the reason why we're here is to be in contact with people. What else, what other reason are you here? If I was up here lecturing and nobody's in the audience, would it be a lecture? If y'all are sitting there in your seats and there's nobody here talking, is it a lecture? <laughs> no, there's a disconnect because we don't deal with the reality of people and their connections. Uh, I had a colleague that passed away uh, in this, actually in January, and she is someone who I hired when I was at Clark Atlanta University. She was doing the best she could, her name was Eunice McKnight, doing the best she could to bring me back to Atlanta because uh, changes were going on. But she uh, passed away from pneumonia and she was a great friend. Uh, I saw her when she, before she passed, but I expected her to be out the hospital. She didn't make it out, passed away for 13 days. I wrote a book called Clue Seeker. In that book, 13 has been a manifestation for me to know you need to pay attention. It may be different number in your life. You need to pay attention. Things happen in your life, even sometimes you don't know why. So she passed away. I have a colleague who said she had a counseling ses session. A woman that came in looked just like her. My mother said, because both of them were very uh, close to me as my friend and my mom, she said she went to church and the woman conductor looked just like my friend you just passed away. I went, and this is all like with a day period for this information being shared to me. I went to go see a movie called The Revenant. The Leo DiCaprio about a guy in the wilderness. Revenant means coming back from the dead. When people thought you were out and not here. So that's how that movie, it's like blood, guts, and gore. If you don't want to see that, don't go. But the dynamic of someone they thought was gone. <laughs> the day that I went to see that movie, and then I went to the uh, bathroom after the movie, and I came out and I was like, oh, my wallet's gone. So I was walking back to the movie theater, and they said, someone else? Said, yeah, I think I lost my wallet. Oh, someone came in the wallet over there to the office. Someone picked up my wallet and found it. I was like, you must be looking out for me. So 
Some people say when you die and pass, you can still hear. There's a certain time period when you deal with the brain, we'll see it, where there is a time where the soul is still here. So when we deal with Saku, the soul is so important, but we don't pay attention to it today. There's seven divisions of the soul that people talk about. I'm going to say them quick because, again, i got to get through lectures to get to the end. But the seven divisions of the soul. Uh, they say, first one's Ka. It's got Ka, Ba, uh, Ka, Ba, uh, Aku, Sed, Ucha, and, and Ati. So rather than you worrying too much about the distinctive names at this point, there's seven divisions. First one, Ka, deals with your body. Second one, Ba, deals with your breath. You can see somebody when they pass. And that last breath, man. In ancient African symbolism, the ba is represented by the human headed bird. Breath. The ka is represented by two arms like this, like surrender, like Almighty God, I surrender to you. So the issue of the soul in the divisions. You now get into a whole level of science about really what soul really what soul is. So this issue of Heru being a symbol of these elements, that's why this I, Heru, was created. To deal with this so-called reason and purpose we're here on the planet. So you've seen that before, I man. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a right and a left eye. So in African symbolism, symbolism, you have the eye of Heru. It says the right eye. That represents sun. Here is Ra, is the reason why people talk about the origins of certain kinds of like perspectives on monotheism, talking about one guy like Ra. Well, the right eye is the sun. The left <coughs> eye is the moon. So they were studying, as I talk about in Dark Matter, Dark Secrets, the endocrinology of sunlight and darkness. Different things happen during the sun. In your body, different things happen in the moon in your body. So on an ancient level, they had created this this symbol in each not each here. So each component of that eye has a term called a hecate or a fraction, and it's never equal to one. It's always a missing component. So this is how it was broken down. One eighth was for that top part, that one sixteenth was that little kind of triangle part behind the round circle with the eyeball. The circle eyeball is one fourth. The other little kind of front part of the eyeball is one half. One sixty fourth is that bottom area and then that little loop there on the bottom is one thirty two. So they were looking at these fractions in a certain way. And if you break it down as I just explained by separating them on the right side there for you, you see the image of the again eye there on the on your left, it's like, what are they seeing? What are they creating? Why is that even an issue to create an eye like this? So this eye is usually related to what? The third eye. The third eye. Vision is the pool into which all senses pour. Vision. You can have a visualization of anything. You might have saw, like I said, that TV program. Now you think about going to that Caribbean island. Saw a certain image of a male and female, and whatever you are, you're like, wow, I like that. So you have visions. Vision not only reflects images of what exists, it also creates images of what can be. So Brother Akbar talked about the third eye is the eye of prophetic or creative vision. Third eye. So these divisions, it says, the fractions are symbols deriving from the myth that Haru's eye was torn part by Set. So Heru is now what the nephew of Set. Remember his dad was Osiris or Osar. So Set, which is Satan, is having a fight with Heru and his eye was torn apart. So there's symbolism behind how the figures were created. We want to now go to the science of how it was even thought of. So it says the sum of the successive units of this eye is told to one 64 was the missing fraction. The total is 63, 64, but 164 was the missing fraction. What does that have to do with anything about science? 
philosophy, architecture, religion, everything. Because African people don't split things up. Here at Cleveland State University, it might be a biology department, it might be a physics department, it might be a math department. Because that's how the European looks at things. Things are linear, things are split up. African people combine things, yeah. mm -hmm. put it together. It has a relationship whole to what understanding behavior or our reasons for being here. So this whole dynamic of this, this missing 164, it's almost like even with the Sphinx. People talk about the Sphinx in the riddle of it. You got this lion body with a human head. Hmm, what's the riddle? It's pertaining to the human being taming those lower animal senses. You know, you treat people bad sometimes. But you can also treat them righteous. How do you treat them righteous? By what? Following the principles of my eye. My eye, what's that? That's the goddess of truth, righteousness, justice, harmony, balance. Really? We don't know our own African history. So we now what? Doing what others say we should do. We're now acting like others do, rather than knowing our own true histories of things. So the Sphinx itself was dealing with, again, challenging those, or not allowing those uh, lower senses to what control our bodies. So that's what uh, Brother, uh, Brother Akbar and Nobles have tried to explain to us. So seeing things, perceptions, as I said earlier about Harriet told me, you know, traveling free in spirit, and yeah, I rode on spirit today. Perceptions, what do you see on that left side there? How, how do you describe that image on your left? What, what does it look like? A cup. A cup. like a goblin. A vase, something like that. Okay. Two figures. You see two figures? Anybody see, uh, if you flip the goblin up, you see two people kissing? Yeah. Anybody not see two people kissing? Some may say may not see. Some say, well, I can't see, maybe, maybe. It's perception. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, to be more specific. <laughs> Reality is, it's perception. Some people see things, some people don't. So, ancient Africans were studying the brain. Greeks really were not. They were, they looked at the section as some, uh, you know, heathenous activity, you know? the brain up or anything like that. <coughs> but Africans were studying the brain. And so they were seeing some things in the brain. <coughs> if you now turn the head sideways and cut it from front to back, that's called a sagittal section of the brain. So the images in the brain can now be sliced, diced, and looked at. There's a movie out now called Concussion. You know the Will Smith plays in. I call it a powerful film. Again, if you don't like blood, guts, and gore, but concussion teaches a whole lot about brain functioning. And a lot of these images about brain, not really in that movie, but just the importance of the brain, what can happen when it deteriorates, is why concussion can be a good learning film. But in this figure here, you have all these wrinkles up top. Those wrinkles are the cortex. The cortex is what gives us the thinking capacity. <coughs> Below that cortex, you see that, that long white line? That long white line is called the corpus callosum. Sorry, I don't have a, anybody have a pointer? Not the, the long white area is the corpus callosum. That connects your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere. So you don't have one, you have really one brain, but you have two hemispheres that may have two different roles to play. Well, you see that little blue area and that dot in the middle? That's the thalamus. The thalamus is very important for integration. We say integration, not like civil rights integration, not like 1954 integration. Integration for your senses, smelling. Certain smells give you a certain feeling about something. Certain memories, certain sounds give you a certain feeling. Certain visions make you move. So the thalamus, dead in the center of the brain, deals with integration of that information as it goes through your cortex. Right below the thalamus is an area called the hypothalamus. You see a little triangular, triangular area. It's right below the thalamus, but that's for regulation. 
regulation, meaning that if this room was really cold, there'd be something in here to make it hot. What would that be? Thermostat. If the room was really hot, there'd be something to cool it down. That would be what? Thermostat. So thermostat becomes the regulator. It's the same thing that's going on in your body. <coughs> so chemicals are being released, and they then go to the bottom part of that uh, the <coughs> hypothalamus, the like pituitary gland. Speak up. You all right? Okay, yeah, so the pituitary gland. So that back part of the head with the, like, uh, like the little cauliflower, that's the cerebellum. Yeah, cerebellum. It's for fine coordinated movements. You want to pick up something that's really small, a cerebellum is uh, very is needed. People have cerebellum damage and <coughs> walk like they're drunk because their balances are off. Cerebellum also does the learning and memory beyond just the balance, and there's about 70 billion neurons just in that one area. Versus the spinal cord may have this one billion neurons. So these brain areas, we can't necessarily say that our ancients knew what each one of these areas did. Uh, there's a term called the pineal gland. Not term, there's a biological entity called the pineal gland. The pineal gland in this image here would be, you see where that blue area I said was the hypothalamus? There's a little extension on the back side that's like sitting on the back of the head. That's the pineal gland. I'll show you another image, but I want you to kind of see this in your mind of what people were looking at as they're studying the brain. Because remember they did mummification. They were taking out body parts, putting them in the canopic jars, and storing them, they were studying the body. Can't necessarily say they could manipulate it and now say, oh, they now know what a per certain brain part does. I'm not giving all that credit, but they knew something. The fact that it created that third eye, <coughs> talking about visions, and we now know that that's that area of the brain it deals with visions. The, that. So this is now the same slice of the brain, but spread out. So you can now see like a three-dimensional image almost of the brain. The pineal gland is sitting right there in the center of the brain. So, pineal. So in the daytime, it secretes a chemical called serotonin. So in the nighttime, it secretes a chemical called melatonin. The pineal gland has receptors on it that look just like the receptors in the back of your eyeball. The back of your eyeball, those receptors are called Rods and cones. Rods and cones are what detect vision. Rods, dim light. Cones, color vision. Different purposes. Guess what? On your pineal gland, you have similar cells. People call it a vestigial organ in us, in that, well, it doesn't really function like the eye in us anymore. Lower animals, like lizards or reptiles, in may, but not in us. Uh, I have this book called uh, Endocrinology. And there's a chapter called Endocrine Role of the Pineal Gland. I just want to read this one piece for you about this because it just explains that people may not be describing things properly because they don't know. It says both light and dark cells can be distinguished from the mammalian pineal. So they're acknowledging, guess what, there's some dark cells there. The dark cells contain pigment granules of an unknown nature as well as glycogen deposits of undefined physiological significance. Whenever there's something black, I don't know what it does. <laughs> they call it known in the substantial nitro waste product. We don't know what uh. that one means. For years they've discussed it. It says the dark pineocyte are, or pineocytes are interconnected by tight junctions. For those that know science, tight junctions are quick ways in which information or ions can flow through cells. I'll show you with the image of this. <coughs> Suggesting that electrical signals may be communicated between the cells. So where you have the dark cells in the pineal gland, dealing with vision and the spiritual essence of what happens when people meditate and move to higher consciousness. There's science behind the cells. We can't necessarily say that our ancients knew all that. But they didn't have the microscopes that we have today. But they had a certain knowledge base that hey, maybe they understood knowledge from a different way. The word epistemology means how do you know what you know? The Europeans count measure. If you can't count measure, guess what? It doesn't exist. Africans, it's not that it's affect symbolic energy. You have to feel yourself, feel your way through it. As you feel your way, you know, you kind of get to know a little bit better. That's why dance is like part of our reality. 
European plate, square dance, you can put the numbers there. <laughs> Step right. Wow. Europeans also like the line dancing, because that's easy. It's the same, the same thing over and over, right? <coughs> After you gotta you feel the whole rhythm, the whole beat. And then take you think about hip hop culture, taking vocabulary on a beat to another level. Y'all, we ridicule some of the people in the hip hop and rap. Guess what? You can't do it. We, rap, we, we talk about, how this go to the bad language, Brother Hampton Tony said about putting out positive images. They may be using it in the wrong way because music is a weapon. Using it the wrong way because music is a weapon. But the dynamic of, again, sound and rhythm and movement and singing, that's how your brain functions, isn't it? Psychomotor skills and development all come from the brain. So that area of the pineal gland, when we deal with the inner vision, it looks just <coughs> like the cells on your eyeballs. This is what the, uh, this, this, this first part of the chapter continues, it says, it's an unpaired structure. As you see, this brain there, when you slice it, you got cells on both sides. That means bilaterally symmetrical. Pineal gland is only one, sitting in the deep of the inner brain. Pineal sites resemble sensory cells of the retina. Just talked about that, the retina like cells. So it's almost like inner vision where you're seeing something. And then it says the pineal might in some way be related to reproductive function. That's the easy one because in animals, <coughs> it's been shown that if you actually have the chemical that's released at nighttime, which is <coughs> melatonin, it can actually suppress reproduction. It makes sense for animals that are seasonal breeders. We know our seasonal breeders, why would they have to have that? You think about animals that are living in Cleveland. If they're reproducing during the what, winter months, like right now in February, they might not survive. So the melatonin shuts down the reproductive system so the animal then does not have to what, worry about reproducing. This is happening on a cycle. So seasonal breeders then have a situation where again, now in springtime, guess what? Right, where are these animals coming from? Because now the system, which is now in place as seasonal breeders, is responding to what? Sunlight, moonlight. The body is doing that. The pineal gland becomes the regulator. It's the biological kind, not clock, but the entity in the body that's causing the natural rhythms. So what we're doing here is expressing the importance. So again, they may have been manipulating, taking out brain parts and seeing things and seeing things and seeing things. Perception. Do you see that in there? That corpus callosum, the part that connects the left and the right side <coughs> of the brain, that corpus callosum is that long part of the top of the eye of the root. That dot in the middle, it's not really the pineal gland, that dot is the thalamus, that little dot that's in the center where the blue is. They're seeing things. So you didn't have the front part of the uh, eyeball, not related to the hypothalamus. And that little part that's like going down with a little twirl on the back side, the cerebellum. So the part, the little stalk that's going down at the bottom of the eye, that's where the brain stem and the pons are. You see the same image right there, don't you? Some may, some may not. Our ancient Africans saw that, saw the brain, and are looking at it to conceptualize, wow, this must be the source of really all thoughts, all information. So that's a real brain. A little more detail. So again, I've been showing you color brains. It's easy to know what color and what to draw things. When you see a real brain, you see the same images. Kind of hard to see, but they're in there. Pineal glands in the deep center of that brain. Uh, we talked about Brother Richard King earlier. He's done studies where he looked at the pineal calcification rate that's different in terms of ethnic groups. Looking at a post-mortem, studying that, the point is the calcified pineal band may have an impact on behavior, potentially. We all may have a pineal band that calcifies over time, and it still produces the melatonin, but it may not be in tune with a certain kind of spiritual elements. So all I'm doing is really showing you that the eye of a root, even though we're saying there's some philosophy behind it, some spiritual and symbols behind it in terms of the whole Osirian myth and who Heru was, they were studying the brain to figure that out. Right in the center there it says midbrain. On the top of that midbrain is, a, is a like 
be okay if I move over to the side, point that out? Yeah. You have this pathway that goes right up top, like a flow, like an aqueduct system. That's the area where the cerebrospinal fluid flows in the middle of your brain. So, as cerebrospinal fluid is flowing, it's acting as a cushion for your brain. It's also helping to move waste products in the brain and also just to have chemicals flow around the brain. The pineal gland is sitting there in the fluid. So it makes sense in terms of, again, the chemicals being released and how they can get to certain other parts of the body quicker. That's a pretty neat phenomenon that maybe you can't conceptualize. For me, it's pretty fantastic. because It's like, hey, this is a quick way to get the chemicals out to other parts of the body and brain for what? Conceptualization, perception, mystical experiences. You've heard of some, uh, what do you call it, shamans that mix up some herbs and plants and they call it ayahuasca and they consume it and they have what? Mystical experiences. You heard of some people that take LSD? Lysergic acid diethylamine. It's hallucinogenic. Guess what? People who take LSD have trips. They can, they can what? I don't know, jump off of buildings and fly. Something in the brain is causing that. And the LSD looks just like serotonin as a chemical. I think I'll show that to you later on. So this is the underside of the brain. So if we took the brain, I cut it, and just showed it on the underside. You see the uh, components on the out bottom surface, and all those like little like striations coming off are actually cranial nerves. Cranial nerves go to the eyeball, the tongue, um, the ear. So they then go to certain places to control pretty much the function of your upper body. But some also go down to what control your internal organs. So the brain then becomes a command center to also control your emotions. You control your brain, you control your mind, you control everything. Okay. Some people have an out of whack brain and an out of whack mind, and guess what? They got poor health. Stress will kill you. Mm -hmm. You know how to elevate behind that, above that, and know to master this? This would be immortal. So, if that's a cadaver, and someone's looking at the brain, opening up the brain, and looking inside, the eye rules right there. Our ancient Africans were studying and saw that and conceptualize a whole philosophical base off of this brain that they didn't have the same technology we have today. So we can't say that we're doing something new. We're just uncovering what they already were looking at. That's why we say the eye of Haru and melanin, because now the melanin becomes a component that deals with how this area is functioning at a higher level. So we didn't go to symbolism. Won't go too deeply into this because Brother Richard King has done it in his book. But you're seeing here the, the diadem or the jewelry pieces that can be created that shows the eye of Haru and the uh, cobra and the vulture all having different uh, reasons for their symbolism. One of the uh, images of that vulture looks just like if you outline the area of the brain. <clears throat> So you see the beak going down. The beak is like the area where the hypothalamus is, the area where sort of this called regulation. So the image of the brain is right there in front of you. The issue now is how is that those brain parts are working to elevate your consciousness. <clears throat> That's why it's pretty deep when you go into the brain. So those who know how to work with cars and manipulate cars, guess what? You can go in the brain and manipulate the brain the same way. There's some people that take medications, what to alter them the brains. Probably not a good thing. Some people may need it because they have a depletion of certain chemicals. Okay, you need to work with that. But the diet is never really discussed. Water, nutrients are never really focused on. Oh, take this pill. Come back and see me next week. Poor allopathic medicine. So, again, I'm showing the images here to explain that they when I say they, our ancient African ancestors were looking at all these symbols from what they saw in science and making stories, allegories, and I wouldn't use the word tales, but stories that help us out for today. <laughs>